Good evening. I'd like to call this session of the Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting into order. Before we proceed, I would like to read a brief recognition of Mr. Jim Dorn. On behalf of the City of Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee, we would like to take a moment to recognize the services of James C. Dorn Jr. Jim passed in May of 2020 after an extended illness. We extend our sincere condolences to his family and friends. For more than 22 years, Jim served on this committee, ensuring the city's water and sewer infrastructure was sound and fiscally supported. Our meetings were marked with probing questions from him that sought to get at the reasoning for every decision. He served as vice chair of the committee from 2005 to 2014 and chaired the committee from 2014 to 2016. Jim also served as our representative on the Anwasa Water and Sewer Advisory Committee and was the first member appointed to the city's Planning Advisory Committee. He was recognized by Mayor Sammy Phillips at the 2019 Advisory Group Appreciation Dinner, where many of his colleagues and fellow members praised him for unselfish, caring, and dedicated concern for the city of Jacksonville. We appreciate Jim's service to our committee and to our community, and he is to be admired and copied. We will deeply miss Jim, but he leaves us with his legacy of deep and passionate concern for our community. Thank you. With that, could I now have a motion to adopt the meeting, the, uh, excuse me, the to adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. I move that the agenda be adopted. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The agenda for tonight's meeting is adopted. Next, believe it or not, <clears throat> approval of the minutes from the March 12th meeting. It has been a while since we have met. I hope everybody's had a, a moment to read those all over. And if I could get any comments or corrections that need to be made to it, or a motion to adopt it. I make a motion to adopt. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the March meeting, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The minutes are approved. Thank you. We are scooting along tonight on to the officer elections. So elections are to be conducted annually at the first scheduled meeting following our June 30th date. This is that meeting. So at this time, if I could have a nomination for vice chair, this person shall serve a one year term. I nominate David Terry for the vice chair. I second. I had a motion and a second for Mr. Terry. Any other nominees for the vice chair position? Hearing none, I shall close the nominations. And all those in favor of David Terry say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. David Terry, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would now like nominations for the position of chair. This person shall also serve for a one-year term. I nominate the woman that only needs one name, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> for the record, that's Jill Puff. Any other nominations? I nominate Thomas. And we have Thomas Nickel. Very good. We have two nominations. It's I know you thought he was talking about Randy Thomas, but uh, <laughs> Randy get asked to disqualify himself right. tonight. I was going to say, wait a minute. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. That name is familiar, but I don't think so. Okay. So any other nominations? So we have two. We need to vote. I move that the nominations be closed. There you go. There we go. The uh, nominations are closed. So we get to vote. How, since we have two, majority rule, I do believe. So by show of hands, all those in favor of Jill Puff, raise your hand. 
Nope. One, two, three. Well, Knight's gonna, wait, where's the fourth? One, two, three. Yeah, three, that's three. Ah, okay, all those in favor of Thomas Nickel, raise your hand. One, two, three, and Jill's abstaining. <laughs> Am I allowed to vote? I don't even know. <laughs> yes, yes okay. you are. Yeah. Uh, we had a three to three and a abstain. Uh, which, which column would you like to put your name into? I'll vote for myself. There you, All right. go. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations, Jill. Thank you. And Jill is our new chair, and David, you are our vice chair. Congratulations. Do I get to turn off the gavel already? Or? No. Darn Next it. meeting. Next meeting. <laughs> okay. So onwards to presentations. Uh, number six. Planning board appointment, please. Ah, sorry, planning board appointment. I just skipped right over that one. So this board would make a nomination for a representative to the planning board. Previously, it had been Mr. Dorn. So, um, and then the appointment has to be approved by city council. So this board will make a nomination to city council and go on the next meeting for city council to approve. So do I hear any nominations for our planning board appointment appointee? Can you make it? You can make it. I can make it. Okay. In that case, Mr. Logan, I would like to nominate you as our appointee to the the board. All right. Thank you. All right. You need to vote. vote. Make sure that everybody. All those in favor of his being our planning board appointee, uh, I'll signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. You are he. Congratulations. We do have two new members. <clears throat> At which point did you wish to have those You mentioned? can do that now if you want to. Since we are talking about new people going into various places. Um, one is not here this evening, but that is uh, Mr. Nick Semendaris. However, Steve Kellum, you are here, and we are very happy to have you. Thank you. So resident of the area uh, and with Quadrant Construction, and nice to have you here. So you've been working with uh, Onslow Community Outreach with some of their... Yes, ma'am. Very um, good. New, new, new homeless shelter. Very good. Very good. Nice to have you on the board. Now, Wally, your turn. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> so tonight I thought it would be appropriate. We've been out of, um, I guess, practice for a little while as a result of COVID. So I thought it would be appropriate with three new members. Um, Logan was new, I think, at our March meeting. And so he's only been to one or two. And then with Stephen and, um, and Nick, I thought it would be good to kind of give an overview of the water and sewer uh, fund and the water and sewer infrastructure that that fund covers um, and what this board is actually responsible for. So I'll kind of walk through our system, our assets, and then our current projects that we're working on. Um, I'll keep the projects very brief. I'll, I'll just kind of touch on them, mention them. If there's one that you're interested in, I can certainly go into more detail. Uh, we have Jason Miles with engineering here to support that as well. So with that, We'll get started with water. Um, this is our water treatment process, just kind of a, a timeline, if you will, of, of how we, from the, with the city, um, where we get our water from and how we deliver it to our citizens. So our water actually comes from two well fields, the Castle Hain well field and the Black Creek um, aquifer. I'm sorry, not well, but uh, from the aquifers. Um, the Castle Hain is a shallower aquifer. It's roughly 200 feet deep, give or take. And the Black Creek is anywhere from six to 700 feet deep. The water from the Castle Hain is actually pumped to our water treatment plant. And there it's treated and then moved into storage where it can be used by our residents. Uh, the Black Creek water is um, of such good quality that we don't actually have to treat it. We just have to chlorinate it 
and we send it directly into our system for our residents to use. We have 14 Black Creek wells. Um, right now, we are currently permitted to withdraw 1.5 million gallons per day from the Black Creek. We have 20 Castle Hayne wells. Um, in 2010, the city, as a requirement of the um, Coastal Plains Capacity Use Act, um, got out of or, or moved away from the Black Creek to the Castle Hayne aquifer. And we had to reduce our withdrawal from the Black Creek. Um, prior to that time, we were solely reliant on the Black Creek. Um, the, at that time, we also constructed the water plant. We installed um, raw water transmission mains to get uh, water from those Newcastle Hain wells to our water treatment plant. And we installed the, the picture you see there is actually our um, 2 million gallon ground storage tank at the water treatment plant. Um, we have uh, nine water storage tanks total. Um, seven of those are elevated. We'll talk about those in a minute. And then we have this one at the water treatment plant that's a, a ground storage tank. And then we have one that is actually underground at Gum Branch Central. And that's where um, the Black Creek Wells um, along uh, Ro uh, Roadstown Road and Gum Branch Road pump to. And it's stored there. That's a half million gallons and it's pumped into the city. Uh, we have over 250 miles of water line, if I remember correctly, is actually closer to 275 or 280. And our average daily demand for water is 3.8 million gallons. This is a picture of the water treatment plant. These are the trains inside of the plant. This is the primary source of treatment. We do have some cartridge filters they remove the bigger stuff, but um, these are the pressure vessels that the water moves from um, to um, in treatment. And then the, the Black Creek does have odor to it. Um, it's a sulfur smell. So we do remove the um, odor through these biofilters. It actually um, water's pumped into the top, it kind of rains down, and um, we have um, plant material in there that kind of consumes the odor. Excuse me, that's the Castle Hain has the sulfur, not the Black Creek. Sorry, thank you, the Castle Hain, yes sir. Thank you. Good catch. And then from there, it goes through the mixing tank and into our water storage tank and we can pump it into our system. We have seven elevated water storage tanks. Um, they, the elevated tanks store a total of four and a half million gallons per day. Um, they're spread throughout town. We have one in Northwoods, one on Gum Branch. This is the Commons tank. Uh, we have one in the Bryn Mawr area, one off of Ellis, and then, of course, the downtown tank. Um, those tanks require uh, quite a bit of maintenance. It's specialized. That's not something that we can do in-house. We have contracted maintenance on those. Um, right now we have uh, six of the seven tanks on contract with um, Suez for the maintenance of those tanks. The only reason we don't have the seventh on there is we've brought them on as they've had to be painted. So we have one left that will have to be painted and brought into uh, the tank maintenance. And that includes both the exterior and the interior of these tanks. Um, and the current annual cost of those is to maintain those is roughly $255,000. Yes, sir. I'm over here. <clears throat> you, you said it's specialized maintenance. What is the specialized maintenance? What does that mean? They have to, one, in order to do anything, they have to be certified to climb, um, and they have to have special equipment to do that. We used to do some of that in-house, but <clears throat> what we found is that it was kind of expensive to upkeep and maintain and um, to keep those people certified. In addition, it's special coatings. Um, you know, some of these tanks are metal. The uh, commons is composite. Um, so there are... Um, special materials and coatings that they have to use that 
you know, we as uh, we as the city just don't have that specialty. Um, with that, though, several of these tanks actually have cellular towers on top of them. And we have lease agreements with all of the big carriers, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon. And the revenue that we receive from our water tanks um, into the water and sewer fund to help offset that is actually 335000 So we actually bring enough in to more than cover the cost of the maintenance of these tanks. So that is certainly a benefit. I got one yes, question sir. about it. So when you either paint the inside, do you have to drain it out? So when yes, you sir. drain it, does that hurt service to people in that area? We we try to we try to be careful about when we do that. We try not to do that when we have higher demand times, like the middle of the summer when it's so hot and it's been dry. How long um, but yes, we it? do have to take the tank completely out of service. It typically takes anywhere from a week to 14 days um, when we take one out of service. We have enough storage that it really doesn't hurt. Um, you know, most of the people don't see a difference. Um, the one caveat to that is the Cummins tank. Gotcha. Because we really only have two water tanks um, on what we call our high side of town or on the in the western Commons Brimmar area. Uh, it's the Commons tank and the Brimmar tank. And the problem is the Commons tank is so large and so high that um, we can't get water out of the Brimmar tank when we're using the Commons tank. But the Commons tank is so large and provides pressure when we take it offline, we, sh we have struggles too. Mm -hmm. So that's, the Commons tank has really been our largest challenge when we take that one out of service. And we're, we're definitely careful when we take that one out of service. And did we don't we allow it to stay out of service for any extended period of time. Did we not have a back in some of our earlier meetings that we were going to have to take the common tank out to raise it? No, we wouldn't have to raise it. Um, we need to take the commons tank out of service to actually do some maintenance on the inside of it. Um, and that's something that we will probably schedule um, over this winter to do. And the, the project that you're remembering was actually the other tank that we um, can, cannot currently utilize with the Commons tank. So we would look at, okay. we do have a CIP project to look at whether we put a booster pump on it or whether we raise the tank. So you're correct. We did have a discussion on that, though. Moving on to wastewater. Excuse um, me, before you do that. Sure. One comment, and that is when you did the water treatment plant, that was a significant investment requiring a large number of bonds. And it is part of the cost that's every year being paid, and it supports the higher rates for the water. So the water treatment plant being moved out of the Black Creek, having to build that, has an impact that is uh, seen by the customer in that we have to service those bonds. And if I, was it a $20 million plant bill? It was, the, the total project was $45 million. And that project was, act, that project was not bond funded. That project was actually funded by um, low interest loan from public water supply. But it's still paid back. It's still gotta be paid back. That's yes. correct. And yet it is one of the most modern water treatment plants on the East Coast here, uh, so we have that, and it has much more capacity than we're currently using. That is correct. But it does impact the uh, enterprise fund in that you have to pay that loan back. That is correct. Thank you. So moving on to wastewater, um, the area that you see in blue is the city limits of Jacksonville. You see the, all the little squares are small pump stations that we have spread around the city. Um, essentially, what we do is we move the wastewater to a central location. That would be our main pump station, which is uh, right near Quartz Plus. And then we pump it out of town, roughly about seven miles through a 36-inch force main to our land treatment site. And um, we do not do traditional treatment like many other municipalities and um, sewer providers. 
we land treatment is um, all natural. What, if we bring it into our plant. We run it through our headworks. We um, send it through aeration trains. And from there, we irrigate it on trees, which is why it's such a large area. And um, just a fun fact, I think the city is somewhere around 26 square miles. And our land, tr land treatment site is somewhere around 12 square miles. So we have about half the area to treat the wastewater that's generated from the city. With that, it, it creates some um, interesting things. The city has roughly 600 miles of pipe. 300 of that is, or roughly 300 of that is in the city of Jacksonville, um, in city limits. The other 300 or close to 300 is actually at the land treatment site. And that's to move the wastewater from the lagoons out through the irrigation field. We have um, in the city 45 wastewater pump stations that we have to operate and maintain. Um, we have a large number of pump stations because as you're uh, fully aware, Jacksonville is pretty flat. So we use gravity sewer where we can and we move it to a point where we can no longer move it any further and then we pump it to another point that we can move it. So it's, um, it does require a fairly large number of lift stations um, to move the wastewater through town. We have 7,500 acres of uh, forest at Land App. Um, what I will say is not all of that is irrigated. We have buffer zones and conservation areas. Um, so we really only wet roughly 2,500 acres of it. But we do that through 21,000 sprinklers. Um, we have storage capacity, as you can see in the picture, we have um, three large lagoons. They store um, around 690 million gallons of water. Our average daily flow is somewhere around 5.4 to 5.5 million gallons per day. And at the site, because it's such a large area, we have site roads, we have 65 miles of road that we also have to maintain. Those are primarily gravel roads, gravel and dirt roads. We don't have um, paved roads out there. I have a question for you, Wally. With that 5.4 million gallons per day, I know we've been concerned about uh, leaks into the system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and we've been going around trying to, to reduce those with the smoke testing that staff has been doing in various areas and replacing pipes. How has that number done over the years? Um, I think what we've kind of seen from the inflow and infiltration work that we've done is that we've really kind of offset the growth that we've seen. Um, you know, the we're always going to have and we're always going to be chasing inflow and infiltration into our system. But um, by going and fixing it, we do recapture some of that capacity. But at the same time, the city continues to grow. And um, to me, the, the biggest thing, it's not easy to go out and quantify and say, oh, you know, we stopped 50,000 gallons from getting in. But over time, what we see is that um, while there are large spikes when we have rain events showing that we have inflow and infiltration, as it averages out, we're not seeing huge... Um, climbs from the uh, development that we've seen over time. Okay. Even if you go back years, you're still not seeing, um, you know, the, it's, it's almost like we're doing enough to try to offset some of our development that's entering into the system. Which helps with not having to expand pipe sizes or... Uh... And those kind of things. That's correct. So, and it's one of the things that we will continually chase. Yes, sir. Wally. So... How do you identify where, where you go chase those leaks at? I mean, are, are, you, are you quantifying things from individual stations that are calculating pass-through volume? And We do. Um, all of our 45 lift stations have some sort of monitoring system on there. Um, in most cases, we don't have flow meters, which would be the most accurate way to do it. Uh, but what we do is we watch run time, pump run times. 
and where we see, you know, a pump all of a sudden start running a lot longer, you know, that can be an indication of a couple of things. One, that something happened upstream and there's a whole lot more water coming in, or you could have, you know, it's spun an impeller or something like that. So it's trying to run longer because it's not moving as much water as it used to. So we start there, we go look at the station and, you know, we'll do a drawdown test or something mm -hmm. like that to see if the station looks like it's pumping more than it should be. Um, and from there we have um, jet trucks and camera trucks. Uh, we camera roughly 10% of our system each year. So we go look for those things and as we find them, we note them and turn them over to engineering. And then what engineering tries to, you know, we we look for the bigger items. Right. Um, and, you know, we go repair those first. And unfortunately, we've captured most of those bigger items, you know, the low hanging fruit. Right. Now we're kind of into chasing, you know, cracks and breaks and leaky joints and those kind of things. Right. Now, periodically, we have found that, um, you know, we run sewers along streams because that's the low area. So we, we, as we do that, every once in a while, you'll find a manhole that shifted or something like that. And as a stream flood, it, you know, it dumps in. into it. Yeah. So we do use that too. And then um, Jill was actually at our land treatment site from the time it was constructed. So they could, you know, there's things that they could see directly in the influent. So, um, and I think that I've heard William say several times, you know, we've got to have something in the, the northern side of town because when it dumps there, when a storm moves across that, our influence spikes almost immediately. Wow. So we use things like that to go look. And then <coughs> from there it gets harder because you're actually using manpower to go out and walk lines that are along streams and those kind of things. Okay. This is kind of an overview of our process at the land treatment site. The raw wastewater comes in, it literally goes through what we call the headworks, <clears throat> which is a step screen and a grit chamber to remove um, the larger stuff, the solids, those kind of things. And then it goes into um, the biological treatment, which is um, now you're well familiar for those that have been here a while, the blue frog system. So we have two aerated trains that it moves through. Um, and, you know, we have active aeration and then more passive aeration. And then from there it goes into storage. And then the final treatment is... Um, it is sprayed onto the trees. In our treatment process, we only use two chemicals. Um, the first one is hydrogen peroxide. We use it for smell. And Jill's gonna correct me if I'm wrong. And then the second is actually chlorine. And we feed that into, as a disinfectant, into what we're irrigating. And we do that for our operators because they're out in contact with the wastewater that we're irrigating. I miss anything there? Nope, you got the hydrogen peroxide actually goes in at the beginning of the process before the step screen in the grit chamber for odor control so that we're a good neighbor. Yeah, we try to, I, and I can guarantee you from being out there and being at the landfill, we are a whole lot less smelly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, what one of the laterals looks like. Um, you can see the sprinkler kind of sprinkler kind of right there in the middle, and then you have a buffer on either side. Uh, our primary cover crop is pine. Um, and this is just an action uh, in action. Uh, we have 95 miles of lateral um, mowing that we have to do. And, you know, I think sometimes when we talk about this, pic people picture a golf course. You know, this is this is wooded area. It's natural terrain. We didn't go in and grade our laterals. They put them in with, you know, the natural topographic or topo that's there. Um, so we use um, specialized equipment, mostly tracked machines to do that mowing. Um, we also do pod rehabilitation, you know, over time as the hard tan, um, you know, the, the layer under the ground starts preventing the uh, water from percolating down. We'll go through and we'll break that up. Or if we have areas that seem to, you know, stay wet all the time, we go investigate and try to repair those areas. 
so we don't lose them to, um, you know, so we can't spray. Um, so we have a lot of just maintenance, as you can imagine, with an area this large. Uh, we also have several partnerships with NC State. Those have been very beneficial. They've looked at everything from what would be the um, best cover crop. You know, is there something out there that's better than pine um, for our system? You know, that would take up more water. It would be more marketable in the end um, to... Uh, They've come out and done uh, water balance studies to show what happens to the water on the site. You know, how long does it hold? Um, what's the <clears throat> capacity of the soil in the area? It's we've had some pretty interesting um, partnerships with NC State, and uh, they've gone out and secured grants for most of this work. They've administered most of it, so it's um, we've had a, a really great relationship with NC State. And then we have forestry management and everything associated with it. We do everything from clear cutting to thinning and harvesting. And we've done control burning, although we haven't done that in a few years. And we even do rotational herbiciding as necessary. So we have a, you know, our, our land app site is really a unique site. It's a, um, Wastewater treatment plant in a forest, and we have to manage both. Wally, how have the um, wildlife been behaving with those 21,000 sprinkler heads? I, it's a great place for wildlife. They love it. Well, <laughs> we I was have, just wondering about the bear. Oh, we have bears, and we have uh, a lot of deer and turkey and snakes, and what else am I missing? I just want to make sure they weren't breaking them or anything. No, no, we haven't had any. And actually... Um, we allow hunting also you do allow hunting. to help control the deer population. So. Wally, for the new members uh, and the old members may need to be reminded, would you make a comment about the spraying restrictions? The state doesn't let you just spray as you wish. And the other is the problem that we have with the free board going away during hurricane season. Right. Our, our biggest challenge to the site is the weather. Uh, you know, it, we, we get... Um, what, 50 to 60 inches of rainfall a year, and we're trying to put another 50 inches or so of rain on top of that. And there are certain restrictions. We can't, um, you know, we can't irrigate if it's actively raining. We can't irrigate if there's standing water or running water. Um, so we have a lot of restrictions that we have to follow. And in some cases, if it's, you know, if it's, not necessarily raining today, but it rained hard today and the ground is saturated and it can't take up anymore, we can't spray tomorrow. So we have a lot of weather-related um, coordination that we have to do uh, in operating and managing the site, which is why we have such large storage. The, the challenge becomes when you've stored so much, eventually you've got to get it out. So um, that's probably one of our biggest challenges at the site. So we can't have the water reach a certain level in those ponds or lagoons. Correct. We do have because maximum levels a, of storage. If we uh, have it exceed the freeboard, then the state comes down and gives us a rather hefty fine. That is correct. Don't worry, William. I, I love William's quote. It'll go out on the field before it runs over the berm. So <laughs> he's not going to let it fill up too much. Uh, we also have two state certified labs. Um, this is where um, Jill Puff was involved. She was our chemist for 30 two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, she is intimately familiar with both labs, but we have one at the land treatment site and one at our water treatment plant. The one picture is actually at the water treatment plant. Um, we do everything from um, daily drinking water analysis for uh, process control to our monthly distribution samples. Uh, we do have certain things that we have to send out. You know, we do lead and copper every three years. Those have to go out. We have some others that have to go out. Um, but for the most part, the, the labs are there um, to make sure that our processes are correct. Um, we're following all of the requirements. Um, and, and 
you know, this is done with three people. I, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. And if, um, you know, just to really give the, the lab more credit, they not only do they do that, but they actually support our engineering folks um, and our stormwater folks whenever we have um, an illicit discharge or a spill or, you know, sometimes we can't figure out whether it's groundwater or whether it's drinking water. You know, water's coming out of the ground, but we do have natural springs and, and high water tables in this area. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's actually groundwater or drinking water. So our lab helps with those as well, as well as doing any um, samples for new construction. You know, if a developer goes in and installs you know, a thousand feet of new water line, our crews will, they'll, they'll chlorinate it, let it sit, and then they'll flush it. And then our crews will pull a back T sample and we take that to the lab and the labs, you know, run the test on those. So um, not only does the lab support both water and wastewater processes, but they all also support um, stormwater and engineering as well. Which leads me to engineering. The other thing that um, water and sewer helps to fund um, is our engineering division. And engineering is um, responsible for all of the city projects and any infrastructure that gets built within um, city limits. So our um, engineering has construction inspection inspectors that go out and oversee you know, when a developer's installing um, new water and sewer lines as part of a, a development, or um, whether you have somebody tying into our existing water system, you know, they go out and make sure that those things are done properly. But we also do water and sewer projects, and our engineering division is also responsible for those. Right now, we have um, a total of 17 projects that we're working on. Uh, some of those are CIP projects, you know, capital improvement plan projects that you've seen. Uh, some of those are just smaller projects that maybe didn't reach the level of a capital improvement plan. And, you know, Anthony needs support on, you know, how we make a certain repair or something like that. Um, but just to kind of run through the, the current projects that we have, um, we have two projects that are water treatment plant. Uh, for those that have been on the board for a while, I know you've heard about both of these projects. Um, the first project is repairing the concrete base that's under the chemical storage tank at our water treatment plant. Uh, the challenge here is the um, we're having we're we're having trouble figuring out how to store the chemical, be able to use it and keep the plant operational. And um, we actually bid this project out and it came in well over budget. And when we sat down and talked to the contractors about it, um, there were some change, they recommended some changes um, to the uh, base itself and then some piping that we had to modify as a result. Um, and it, uh, as such, it's also time to replace the, the tanks that we have because they only last for a certain period of time. But one of the largest things is um, they were going to have to figure out how to store this chemical and they didn't want to be responsible. So that had a, um, a large price associated with just coordinating the, the storage and then the usage of the chemical as we're running the plant. So we, we think we've kind of worked through a lot of that. This is a project we're probably 95% done on the design of this project. So this is one that we should have out to bid in the next month or so. Jason's cringing as I say that, but mm -hmm. um, we should have this one out in the next month or so. And then along with that, we have to do some um, adjustments to the chemical feed lines. The way it works right now is we have several chemicals that go out to our mixing tank and they all combine in one pipe and they have water that carries them out. But what we found is there's some sort of reaction inside the pipe as those chemicals mix and mix with the water um, to get to our mixing tank. And it actually creates deposits inside the pipe and plugs up the pipe. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is um, replace that one pipe with several smaller. I think it's a two inch or something currently. 
So we're going to replace that two inch with several smaller. So we keep the chemicals separate, but there's some sort of um, reaction that's happening inside of that pipe and it, it's causing deposits to settle out and clog the pipe. Um, the Castle Heme Monitoring Wells project is one that um, we've been working on for a while. This is a joint project with the Water uh, um, Resources Group. It's us, Omwasa, and the base. Um, the base just installed Castle, Moni uh, Castle Heme Monitoring Wells on base. I think, I don't remember the total number, but I think it was somewhere around 14 or so. Um, they spent just over $400,000 installing those. Um, the city and Omwasa are working to install um, four Castle Hay monitoring wells at Burton Park. We have a grant to do that. We've already taken bids and we're in the process of finalizing the contract, uh, the contract with the contractor to install those. So um, hopefully those will be installed in the next month or two. To update the board members and the public, they're being monitored because we're looking for... Uh, we're monitoring, uh, we actually have um, two things that we're looking at with the Castle Hain monitoring wells. These are going in at Burton Park. And we put in three um, Black Creek monitoring wells at that location. And the reason for the Black Creek monitoring wells was um, to identify the salt freshwater interface in the aquifer and then make sure that we are not uh, moving that the, we're not making the aquifer become salty. So we're, we're making sure that we don't move that saltwater um, interface. And as we were drilling uh, those castle, uh, the, the Black Creek wells, um, we noted that in this location that the Castle Hain aquifer was very, um, I don't know if thick or wide is the right um, w description, but um, what we found is that there, the Castle Hain was very large in this area. So um, we identified that that would be a good place for monitoring wells. One, to look at water quality, water quantity, and um, secondly, we want to make sure that we're not causing because we've moved from the Black Creek to the Castle Hain and Omwasa did the same thing, we want to make sure that we're not causing problems in the Castle Hain. So the monitoring wells are there for the, so that we can ensure that we use the aquifers as sustainably as possible. And then the Indian Drive booster station flow meter is actually complete. Um, that was, we had to, um, reduce some piping at our booster station at Indian Drive. It actually feeds the commons tank um, and it, it pumps water from the Gum Branch area over to the commons tank. Um, so that project is complete. And then we have two generator replacements at well six and seven. These generators have been there since the seventies, I believe. Um, and they just, we were having problems getting them repaired. We couldn't keep them running. So um, we replace, we're replacing them currently. So, and that project should be complete in the next um, month or so. And then the Black Creek well upgrades and the water supply wells, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, um, but what we had is a, a project to go out and redo some well houses for uh, wells that were constructed in the 60s. Um, and we really hadn't done much to them since then, you know, we had done ongoing maintenance, but no renovation, um, no roof replacements or control replacements or anything like that. We just, um, we just maintained them and kept them running. And uh, we decided before we invested a lot of money into the well house and the, the electrical and the controls, we thought it would be good to actually camera those wells and look at them. Um, and when we did that, we found out that um, the three wells that we were looking at doing really weren't worth doing. We were um, we weren't getting the supply out of the out of them that we had been. Um, we thought that we would probably be able to line the well or rehab the well. And what we found um, is that after cameraing them and evaluating them, that they really weren't good candidates. So uh, 
we backed off of that project and moved over to an adjacent site, which was well number one. And we found that it was actually in good shape. We had not been using it uh, because of the piping system. We actually had trouble keeping that well running. It would get knocked off of the pump would get knocked off its curb. Um, or in some cases it would just totally shut down and it couldn't overcome the system pressure. So we, we really hadn't been operating that well and it was in very good shape. Um, the water quantity that we can get out of that well um, looks to be about what it was when it was originally permitted. So uh, we've moved focus, we've moved over to well one. That will require some piping changes and some pump changes and um, we'll upgrade that well house. And then as part of that, we'll come back and look at two, three, and four and look at possibly just abandoning, abandoning those and um, consolidating into one well, one larger well. So um, that, will, that study will take a little more time, but we're moving forward um, with well one and it's, um, probably in 60 or 70% design at this point. So we should hopefully we'll be moving forward with that um, after the first of the year. And then the Newbridge infrastructure project, this is actually part of an overall larger project for um, streetscape, repaving medians and stormwater. But it does, um, the water in particular on Newbridge Street is in extremely bad shape. Um, we have to repair it quite frequently. We have leaks um, pretty uh, pretty frequently. So uh, it, the water really needs to be replaced along Newbridge Street and the sewer as well. We, I think we're doing um, most of the sewer with lining. Um, I don't think we're going in and actually replacing all of the sewer, but uh, you know that's just older infrastructure that needs to be addressed and replaced. And that will be coordinated with the overall larger project of the streetscape. And that, um, that project's a several year project and um, we're doing the, some stormwater work now. If, you're, you know, if you travel down Newbridge Street, uh, right beside Charles Riggs's office, uh, we have, we're putting in new stormwater pipe. And that's kind of the start, that has to be done before we start the rest of the project. On our sewer projects, we do have, um, if you remem remember Triangle Mobile Home Park, um, that they have, the owner has removed all of those mobile homes, um, but there's still uh, sewer infrastructure there. And we're going through and we're going to line all of the infrastructure that has to stay because it does serve more than just mobile home park. We have a lift station there that serves um, some of that larger commercial area. So we will, um, in an attempt to get rid of some of the inflow and infiltration into our system, we will line the, uh, the infrastructure that has to stay, and then we're going to abandon the rest of it. So the, the small services that were just internal to the mobile home park will go through and abandon those. And we anticipate that that will help um, eliminate quite a bit a bit of I and I that comes into our system. And that is one of the lift stations that as soon as it rains, you can see that high, that wet well go high. Uh, it's, that one is, um, that one definitely has some inflow and infiltration into it. And we have the Ellis pump station. I should have included a picture of this, um, but I know you've seen it a couple of times. The, you know, this is one that was flooded during Florence. There, the, the lift station six, sits probably five or six feet off the ground, and it was a good two feet into the lift station during Hurricane Florence. So we're still dealing with the repairs, but ultimately we're going to um, either need to change the design of that lift station to become, you know, a, a submersible type station where we raise um, we raise the uh, wet well above a floodplain or we relocate the station. And uh, engineering has been working with um, 
Finance and FEMA on the repair and upgrades, interim upgrades to the station. And we're looking at a grant for either the uh, full repair, rehabilitation, or relocation of the station. And we have a biofilter upgrade at Brumbar Pump Station. The biofilter that we have there is just, it's undersized. Uh, and Brimmar Pump Station and Ellis Pump Station were basically built off of the same plan. They're very similar. And um, ironically, the biofilter at Ellis was flooded during that, during Florence. So we have to replace the biofilter at Ellis. So when we do the biofilter at Ellis, we're going to go ahead and do the biofilter at Brimmar as well. So we'll probably, um, while that's in FY21, we will probably go ahead and include it as part of the project for Ellis. And then we have um, the Decatur lift station elimination. Um, Decatur lift station is located in uh, Northwoods, and it sits right beside a stream. It does not have a large wet well. It does not have much holding time. And... Um, the pumps are, um, help me out, vacuum primed? Are they vacuum primed? They're not submersible. So, thank you, they're suction lift. Um, and we have trouble sometimes getting them to stay primed. And that is a site that concerns us because if that station floods, it will end up in a stream and it will be a reportable spill and we will probably face fines. Um, the good news to that <coughs> is that there is a sewer line that is several hundred feet away from this, a gravity line um, that's several hundred feet away from this. And the um, surveys indicate that we can actually eliminate this station and tie into that gravity line. Um, and that gravity line actually runs between Williams Farm and uh, Brookview. So we'll we'll have to get some easements and um, we're running right along a ravine, but um, it would be nice to eliminate that station, not only because we have that operation and maintenance expense, but it is one of those um, stations that if it if it spills, it's not going to be good. And well, then uh, we already talked about New Bridge. A lot of so, these projects you're talking about, such as the New Bridge uh, utilities that need to be upgraded that are whatever, 40, 50, 60 years old. How are, how are those funded? How, where, where? So the, um, that's a great question. So the uh, Water and Sewer Fund funds all of the projects related to Water and Sewer. Um, these are projects that are either um, rehabilitation or replacement of existing infrastructure. So those are funded through the rates that citizens and businesses pay on their monthly bill. When we have projects like one I'm going to talk about in just a minute that have an element of growth in it, or it's a new station or line that serves new development, it the the cost of that is actually calculated and it's covered by system development fees. So that's where uh, being in construction, you're familiar with paying our water yes. and sewer system development fees. Right. Those fees are calculated based on the projects that serve growth. Now there are um, recovery costs also covered in that. So like our water treatment plant where we you know, not only did we build a water treatment plant to serve our existing customers, New we Bridge. built a water treatment plant that could handle growth. So the growth portion of that is paid for and reimbursed by the system development fees. Gotcha. And same thing on the sewer side. So we have, um, it, you know, if it's a, a rehab, a, a rehabilitation or a replacement project, then that's pretty much covered just by the monthly bills. Okay. And if it's a, you know, now you can have, we do have split projects where, you know, we replace, you know, Ellis really isn't a good example because most of that basin's built out. But when we did Henderson Drive, we actually 
built, we added capacity to that station. So when we added capacity, the portion of the cost of the capacity was attributed to the system development fees. Gotcha. Well, if I could interrupt for a minute, because th it's an important point here. Most people don't appreciate that the water and sewer fund, as you refer to it, is an enterprise fund. And by definition, it does not get general revenue. It's not part of the general fund. So the taxes don't pay for what goes on in your water and sewer fund. That has to either come from, as you said, rates or the uh, facility or bonds have to be taken out or a loan by the fund, which That's are correct. not paid for by your taxes. So it's a self-sustaining uh, source of money that you can't just go out and do things. And as a result of that, it leads into something this board does that's very important. That's the review of the capital improvement plan because right. there we look at what projects need to be done and then we question, is it something that we can pay for or is it going to shoot the rates through the roof or can we take out loans and give our advice to the council and Wally on what we think is the best <coughs> thing for our citizens. But the important point is Water and Sewer Fund is an enterprise fund independent of the property taxes, sales taxes, and the things that people have a tendency to blur when they talk about it. And that's why your rates are so important. And that's why this board often is fighting with the facts to keep the rates low and say, can we put that project off or not? But they're sources for the fund, but taxes are not one of the sources of fund. It's either the rates, loans, bonds or the facility fee that the state now mandates be done in a certain way. It's got, what is it, 20 year? The system, devel uh, the system development fee um, is a, uh, has statutory requirements and you have to have a, a 10 year capital improvement plan um, and you have to have master plans that support it. And, you know, I will say that that's one thing that the city is very good at looking where, um, you know, we can't predict future development, but we can look at what infrastructure would be necessary to serve future development should it happen in an area. And we do a very good job of that. We have um, both water and sewer models that we use to, you know, figure out what would be necessary. And there are some cases where, you know, we have a, you know, a development project that happens that causes upgrades internal to the system and you know that is picked up through either an agreement with that developer uh, requirements of that development or if it serves more than just one development it may pay, be picked up through system development fees thank you great question and then we have a couple of projects that are on hold we have the uh, western regional uh, pump station and sewer project. You know, this is one that we've been talking about for many years. Um, we are, you know, this project is one of those that will be necessary, um, especially as the Western and Gum Branch area uh, out to Ramsey Road continues to develop out. Um, but we're trying to time, you know, and I, I know you've heard me say this several times, but we are trying to time that project appropriately because it is a large project. I mean, we're talking a $40 million project. Um, and we are, you know, we want to make sure that we are ready and prepared, but we're not too early either because that's a large investment to tie up. And um, a portion of this project does um, relieve uh, pressure on the existing system. So there is some that is picked up by the um, water and sewer rates. And then a large portion of this is um, for new growth as well. So that part of it is um, calculated as part of our system development fees. Is that the extra line going across the river? It is, yes ma'am. Right now we only have one. Yes. That is correct. So we have one, uh, we only have one force main that goes out to our land application site. So obviously that is, um, a potential area, um, a problem. So this would be a, 
a second line, although it would not carry, it wouldn't be redundant. So it wouldn't be that we could just transfer all the wastewater over here. But what it would do is um, it would set us up so that we could transfer a large portion of it and it would relieve some of the, the wastewater that already goes through that line. So it does give us two paths out to the land application site. Well, that brings up an interesting thing that may be a good to bring up now, and that is our relationship with the Marine Corps base and our ability to shift water sewer. I'll because do that on the point. next one. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have the LTS um, South Storage Lagoon baffle uh, that we're that we have on hold. The reason that this is on hold is, um, well, the reason for the project is um, our South Lagoon is kind of shaped like a, I don't know, a kidney bean. It's kind of got a large area that goes into a smaller area. And when the wind comes across and blows water, especially when the lagoon has a lot of water in it, um, it'll actually build up momentum <clears throat> across the lagoon and as it narrows, it kind of funnels things to the end of the lagoon. And we've, during storms, we've actually had water push up um, to the top of the liner and some left debris on top of the road. We haven't had any, uh, you know, danger to our embankment or anything like that, but we want to make sure we don't have that either. So the idea would be, you know, for those familiar with, um, boats in the marine industry, you know, we were looking at something like a wave break. Mm -hmm. The problem is everything we found basically says that, you know, when winds get above a certain mile per hour and it, the one that comes to mind is 50 or 55 miles per hour, then you have to take it out because of the wind pressure on it. The problem is that's when we need it. So we really haven't found anything that's going to work yet. Um, so it kind of put it on hold. And the other is, you know, it's under certain circumstances. It's during a major event. And it's also when the lagoon is full. So we don't have that problem when we don't have as much water in the lagoon. So I'm not saying that this isn't something that we should look at and continue to, to study, but we just haven't found, you know, at first we thought we'd find an off the shelf solution because they have wave breaks for marinas all over the place. The problem is most of those are either made to break loose or to be taken in once the wind gets over a certain, um, a certain threshold. So, and then the last one is the Bryn Mawr force main relocation. I think this is a appropriate place to talk about um, agreements that we have in place with Omwasa and the base um, for treatment at the Marine Corps base. <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that we've looked at is the possibility to turn roughly 1.1 million gallons of wastewater um, from our system going out to land app, actually over to the Marine Corps base to their advanced wastewater treatment plant. Um, the, we've talked to the base about this. They're open uh, to doing that. We have, we conducted a study to look at you know, how would we move it to them? And we looked at five or six different scenarios. And the real challenge uh, came in that um, the scenarios ranged in price from roughly $6 million to 12 or $13 million. And the recommended, um, the recommended solution, which didn't require, um, it, it, it required a lot of piping but not as many uh, system improvements, you know, to other pipes and other stations was roughly $11 million. And, you know, when we still got capacity at the land treatment site and we still were, you know, we've still got some capacity at the main pump station, it doesn't make sense to spend that much money to move a, you know, 1.1, if you remember the numbers that I gave you earlier, you know, we were in the 5.4 range. We're talking a fifth of the system, you know, a fifth of the flow. You know, that's a, that's a great way to extend the life of our land treatment site and to continue to be able to grow, but we don't have to do that right now. So that's a, you know, a large investment that we've decided now's not really the best time to take that on but it's something that we've looked at, we've studied, we've evaluated the routes, 
we know what would be required. So it's something that we can move forward with in the future if necessary. Okay. So, and right now we do have, um, I think to get to your question, we do have an agreement with the base. We send, a, I don't remember the exact number, but I wanna say somewhere around 20,000 gallons a day, maybe a little bit more um, from our Piney Green station, which is Poplar Branch over to or through on Wassa to the Marine Corps base. And we actually have agreement to take up to a million gallons to the Marine Corps base. Yes, sir. Question, been on here a while, and I don't know if this question's ever been asked, but it probably has, uh, maybe I just didn't hear it. Out at LANAP, is there any room for growth for the ponds themselves? So, um, we expanded, we added the South Lagoon when we did the expansion. And one of the things that I, I, we've learned operationally, and I've heard William say uh, several times, um, and I think, I, I'm not gonna put words in Jill's mouth, but I know she's there when we were talking about it. Additional lagoon storage is not necessarily the answer. Um, the problem is when we, if we add additional storage, yeah, that takes us longer, but the problem is we still got to get that out onto the same field. Um, the, the real answer is figuring out how to expand either the irrigation capacity or look at some other type. And we actually have a study right now um, with a hydrogeologist and they are out there looking at um, the possibility of um, transitioning some of our irrigation land into infiltration basins. And that would be, uh, you know, you're talking from taking an area that you can only irrigate every third day or so um, and put out, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand gallons to, you know, an infiltration basin that we've been, what we've been looking at is somewhere from four to six million gallons per day of infiltration. So we are looking at um, other, you know, lower cost opportunities. Um, that's something that if we did go to that, it would require, you know, there are different hurdles. We need to know if that's possible. But there's also other hurdles that we would have to overcome. Like right now, infiltration basins require a higher level of treatment than we actually do at land treatment site. So, um, but we are looking at what other opportunities are there for the future. Talking of the quality, would you make a statement as to what the quality of the water is now that you spray? Sure, we, we do, um, so the technical or state term is we do secondary treatment. And then um, the higher, uh, you know, traditional point discharge plants, that means they're discharging into a river or a body of water. They are typically, um, help me out, Joe. Tertiary. Tertiary, thank you. <laughs> a word I can't even spell. <laughs> but um, so they're more of, you know, closer to a drinking water quality. Well, what's your credentials for emergency pumping? So if we have to do, and you're talking about emergency irrigation. Irrigation, correct. So we have, um, we, we have certain thresholds that we meet to introduce emergency spraying. And basically what emergency spraying says is that we can spray rain or shine. We can spray no matter what the weather is. Um, Typically, even when we go into emergency spraying, we try not to do that. We try to maximize the spray, but try to give some time for the land to recover as well. Uh, but it, it comes down to lagoon levels and weather, um, and you can spray um, in advance of, I believe it's a named storm. Um, so there are some thresholds that we meet in order to emergency spray. Do we do that often? Uh, have we, we have been in that mode for now the better part of a year. Um, we met with the state and talked to them. One of the challenges that we have 
um, is our, our field at Land App is broken up into different pods, blocks and pods. And those different pods um, have different application rates. Mm -hmm. So it'll say that, you know, in pod one, we can put 40 inches equivalent of rainfall a year on that pod in pod two and make and do 45 or something like that. And it's a rolling total. Um, so it goes from, you know, January to January, February to February, and it just, it rolls. The problem we have and and what the state is acknowledges acknowledged is that if we go through a period where we emergency spray and we just sprayed and let's say that, you know, we put not an average amount of rain, you know, not an average amount of irrigation out, then when, as we're going through the year, we've cut into what we can irrigate on that pod. And what we found is we went through, if you remember, I don't know, 2018 was Florence. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was 2016 or 17 was really wet. And we ended up with um, our lagoons just about full. And we went into emergency spraying and we sprayed and we continued to spray emergency spray. But the problem is, I guess it was immediately following Florence is where we had our problem. But as we got to the end of the year, we were exceeding our permitted levels of rainfall on that pod. But the field was absolutely fine because we were in a dry period. So we talked with the state and they actually said, what you need to do is stay in emergency spraying and level out. You know, the idea behind the rolling total is that over time it averages out. The problem is we had put everything out all at one time and it was going to take over a year to level back out because that that had to, you know, that month had to fall off before things started to level back out. So in that case, we actually stayed in emergency spraying for the better part of a year and a half, I think. Um, and that was working with the state on how to, you know, level that back out and we've actually talked about talked to the state and um, with one of our studies with NC State um, we've got to provide some additional information but they're willing to consider dropping that annual rolling total because they recognize that that is a um, that is a permit limitation not a field limitation it's are a paper out, limitation are we out of emergency spraying now I don't know Derek, do you know that? Are we currently out or are we still in? I know that we stay, we did a, I don't know, Jill, I'll have okay. to check. Um, because we did a, the valve, we had a valve project that mm -hmm. we did. We have a valve that's between the East Lagoon and the West Lagoon. It was broken. And the challenge is that's a small, it's in the berm in a small area. And we stayed in emergency spring to ensure that we didn't have any issues with that valve project because we had to, um, you know, we couldn't we couldn't bring the West Lagoon up. Right. So um, we ended up staying in emergency spraying through that project, which just wrapped up. So I, I don't know if we are still in technically in emergency spraying, but I do know that we have leveled out and we are, all of our pods are in compliance now. Okay. So um, upcoming projects, we have 10 water and sewer projects that'll kick off in FY21. Um, those projects, um, I think seven of those projects will be designed. So they will be multi-year projects. So design will start next year, but we won't move into construction until the, the end of the year or the following, uh, you know, or FY22, I guess it would be. Um, and then three of those projects are scheduled. They're, they're smaller projects. Um, one is the, the sewer line replacement right over here on Warwick Street um, that we need to, to take care of. Those we will design and construct all in the same year. But, um, you know, with our, uh, with our bigger projects, one of the challenges we run into is permitting. Permitting takes time, so we can't, it, it's, 
not typical that we can design and construct a project in the same year um, because it takes time to design the project and then we have to go through permitting also. So with that, if there's no more questions, yes, sir. I have a couple that I, I think would be useful for not only the new members, but the general public. One, would you make a statement about the water quality, especially as it relates to bottled water and the use of water during hurricanes when people make a rush on the water in the grocery stores and so forth? I, I don't recall our water system being out during a hurricane. We have, we have never lost our water system during a hurricane or a storm event. Um, we are... We have generators on most of our Castle Hain wells. We have generator at our water treatment plant. Um, our elevated storage tanks are, um, we have small generators at those for controls, but those are all gravity fed. So, you know, there's no pumps or anything at those that we have to run. So, you know, I didn't, I grew up with, I grew up on a well, and I remember when a hurricane was coming, you filled your bathtub. Actually, you filled both your bathtubs. Um, you Rich know, we, we went and got a bunch of bottled water. You know, we, we really don't, you know, I'm not saying don't prepare, don't buy bottled water, because that's a good idea. But I, we really don't have any danger with losing our water system. You is know, your it, water as good a quality as what's in the water bottle? Oh, absolutely. It's better. <laughs> I'll let Jill talk about that part, but she's, she's the expert. The, but the, um, the, you know, for our biggest, I think my biggest concern would be, you know, for some reason we were flooded and couldn't get fuel, but we were even during Florence where we flood, we flooded and we're like an island. We had plenty of fuel. And I think our, I think the water plant ran for over a week straight on generator during Florence. Um, it was one of the last things to get power back because of um, a substation issue that they couldn't get parts for. So keeping on so, the water quality thing, so when the, you do have a break in the water system, there's a city announcement? There is. Um, so if there were, that that would probably be, a, it wouldn't likely affect an entire the entire water system. Could infect this small area, you know, uh, wind blows a tree over and the roots, roots pull the water main out of the ground. Um, you know, we, we can, I, most of our systems loop. We can isolate that area. We may lose just a few customers. Uh, but, you know, again, the water quality, we would manage the water quality. And, you know, if there was any concern, like you need to boil water or something like that, we would certainly notify the citizens. On a different subject. What is yours and Mr. Thomas's opinion about the work that we do? Does it, does it help you? Or, or, or does the council accept it? Can you give us some examples of where what the Water and Sewer Board has supported or been significant in the impact of the water and sewer system? Do you want me to start or you want to better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, from a staff perspective, I think it's great having a, you know, a citizen advisory committee that we can <clears throat> bring things to discussion items to um, review our projects, you know, on an annual basis. You know, you ask a lot of questions that we have to justify, I think. We do a, a pretty good job of preparing and making sure that, you know, we're prepared for those questions. We try to prioritize, but I think it's, um, I, th I think it's very valuable to have a citizen advisory panel that sits there and takes in all of the information. You get, you get more data um, other than staff than, than anybody else. So you have, you're able to help us um, in making decisions and especially in, you know, supporting those decisions when they move forward. And there's been times where we've actually moved a project out and the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee has said, are you sure you really want to move that project? We kind of see that one as valuable. Why are you moving that one out? And we've had questions from the Water and Sewer Advisory Board or or comments at times where, 
you said, you know, we we really need to do these projects and there's really no way around it. We would we would support, you know, a small rate increase. You know, that that's not just staff saying that. That's a, you know, a a citizen group that is directly affected by decisions that are made helping make those decisions. So I see that as a value. Well, absolutely. It's good to have the, the filter to come through so that we know that everything's been, you know, kind of analyzed and, and scrutinized and so that there's a consensus of the need, especially the rates. I mean, the rates are paramount to the council, I think, because that's where you get your feedback. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we've been challenged so much over the past was it been now 20 plus years since land app, right? You know, it used to be your water bill was $7 or something and now it's 70. So it takes a lot of input to justify. And so people know, at least I think we help as ambassadors too to get the word out of why it's necessary. I mean, I can remember a presentation to a rotary club. I was in 1992 or something. And, and we, we came out of there aghast at what Grant Sparks was you know, <laughs> leading us into. It was like we, and it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we've got a totally, I mean, we've got a top notch, 100% reliable system and it doesn't come cheap, but you know, it's, it's a lot better than having nothing or some, I mean, you know, there's some stuff else, you know, people out, I mean, just down the road from us outside the city, <laughs> if it rains too hard, they can't wash their clothes. I mean, you know, there's, you know, we don't have that kind of issue. So I think, I think it's appreciated. You look at the, the longevity of a lot of the members. So that have contributed, I mean, there's a lot that, well, Carmen Aragona comes yeah, to absolutely. mind. He's, you know, he's got experience in the system. Jim Dorn, obviously, um, Mr. Uh, I can think of many people that served many years that went through these big transitions, primarily the land app the uh, the water Joe's Joe's shop I guess the water, <laughs> the water plant and you know that was a excruciating experience yes. to uh, spend 40 million dollars on something that you were didn't have before or didn't have to pay for but it was a requirement and now we've got basically using it at 50 percent so we know we can I mean it's got eight million and we're using it for four million I mean the capacity of the water plant so we're we're in good shape. We've challenged, but um, I think I think it's an important job. If I may go over one more subject that kind of leads from that, and that is, I'm assuming even this meeting is on the G10, and we're always being uh, the public hearing the conversation. And I would say to the new members that don't assume you know the answer, and don't assume any question that is not meaningful because if you have it somebody in the audience on G10 may have it and so we need to ask every question possible so that understanding comes about and there was a time when this board met and everything was presented after the fact there was no education of the board members we get a great education from Wally's staff now and we, we can talk a lot better about things that in the past were a mystery but in doing so, we need to continue with our new members asking questions as the old ones uh, have in the past. James Dorn was never too shy to ask a question. Oh, he was. And uh, we, we need to continue that, especially when you consider that whoever's watching on G10 may have the same question and they're not here to ask it. So to follow on to the previous question about it is useful and we're providing some good work here. Keep, keep the questions coming in the meeting to Walling and his staff uh, people. And uh, I encourage that, especially with the G10, letting your question be heard in the answer. So. And, our, and, and our citizens need to realize that if we feel there should be a rate increase, that doesn't just affect them, that affects us also. Thank you, Wally. Appreciate it. Speaking of <laughs> financial impacts and rates, uh, we have with us tonight uh, 
Ms. Sabrina Adams. She is our senior finance manager. And I, th I think at one of the last meetings, or at the last meeting, somebody asked what was the anticipated impact of COVID and, you know, some of the businesses closing or, or having to operate minimally and what were the impacts to us. So I asked Sabrina if she would be willing to come and Sabrina is directly involved in the um, receipt of our revenue from our customers. So um, she, there's nobody more knowledgeable in the city when it comes to our revenue. Yes. Good evening. Yes, well now we can talk about the revenue and how we're paying for some of these projects that you've heard about. <laughs> so uh, just topics for discussion tonight. I'm just going to go over a few um, things that have been COVID related as far as uh, the executive orders that the governor <coughs> had issued that affected us. Our build revenues since COVID started back in March our late penalties and the number of account suspensions that we've seen leading up to and during and now as we're coming out of those executive orders. The governor uh, did issue two executive orders, but uh, one, the first one was EO-124 and then after that expired, he issued a, a subsequent order to co just continue that. The first executive order he issued at the end of March, it covered from March 31st and went through May 30th. And then he issued a second order just to extend the first one. And that extended it from May 31st to July 29th. He issued the order to sort of provide some relief for citizens that were affected by COVID. They had lost their jobs or had their hours reduced. And basically what it meant is that from the period of March 31st all the way through July 29th, we were not to disconnect any residential customers for non-payment of their utility bills. We also were not to charge any late penalties on any balances that became due during that same period covered by the orders. So if they had a bill that was due before March 31st, we could charge late penalties in April for that bill. But if the bill due date was actually in that period, we could not charge any late penalties. And then once the order was over, we would have to give payment plans of at least six months for any of the arrearages that they accumulated <coughs> over the period of the orders. So that would uh, give them payment plans that would give them till the end of January to pay off those past due balances. So just to give an idea of where we, how we look with monthly revenues, you can see that we, April and May and June, we have been a little bit lower than we were for those same months last year in FY19, even with the rate increase that we had this year, the 2.25%. So once we got through March, we started to see those decrease. And June revenues look high for both years, and that's because in July we accrue some revenue back. So it's, it didn't really spike up that much in June. It just looks like that for a minute accounting standpoint. But the good news is that overall annual revenue comparison, when we look at FY20 and compare that to FY19, we're still up overall. We had about 19.5 million in revenue uh, on the water sewer user charges. And for FY20, we have 19.8. So we are finishing just a little a little ahead of where we were. Yes, sir. Is that due because of more people tying onto the system? It's due because it, mostly because we had the rate increase, the 2.25%. And so that just helped to offset some of the losses that we had in March once the businesses started to close. I don't think we don't have really a ton of new customers, but. So another impact is late penalties. We waived over $105,000 in late penalties since March. We, even though we weren't charging the penalties, we were still doing a lot of tracking. We had to report to the state uh, some numbers about who, you know, how many waivers we were doing of disconnects and late penalties. We decided to waive them both uh, for both residential and commercial customers, even though the order only required us to do it for residential. We thought it would 
be fair to do it for both since a lot of the businesses were struggling as well. And September uh, bills that are going out, that'll be the first month that the penalties have been billed since March. <clears throat> And also, um, I just want to say about the late penalties that the late penalties are charged. There's a 10% late penalty. Uh, you have a 10 day grace period after your due date. And then after that 10th day, there's a 10% late penalty applied. And you can see our late penalties, what they normally look like during the month. They do sort of vary. Uh, we've been as high in February as uh, 28,000. And you can see May through August zero what's it take to get cut off it takes when you're it's it's not a, a exact number of days but when your second bill comes out you have 10 days from that bill date before you're disconnected gotcha. and so typically it's usually around 45 days um, and there is a cutoff notice printed on that second bill letting you know that you're coming up on a cutoff date Definitely not before you get the second bill. <laughs> and talking about cutoff, we did uh, suspend all of the suspensions for non-payment. And all, again, we did that for both our residential and our commercial customers. We, again, felt it was fair to, to be consistent. We resumed our suspensions just in August. So we've only gone through the first month of that. In August, we decided to go ahead and waive the $55 additional suspension fee for all of our customers because we wanted just to get everyone in on the payment plans. Um, we were aware that maybe a lot of people didn't know that they were required to get a payment plan. So we just, we wanted to make contact with everyone. And then this month in September, we are following the normal suspension process. So those $55 fees will be added to those customers. Sabrina? Yes. You said that the uh, executive order from the governor required you to do certain things for the residential. Yes. But the city decided that they would uh, cover the commercial. Yes. Which I know it's going to seem odd, but I support that. But my question is, is the financial officer for the uh, city all powerful and make that decision on her own? Or was that something that the city manager or the mayor or how was that arrived at? Yes, uh, the city manager, we did, um, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think council had decided, I, I don't recall that, but I believe it was a management decision. There were a few factors that um, we, we wanted to, um, we knew a lot, so a lot of our commercial customers were struggling, we had heard that. Oh. And uh, also, it, it would be a little more um, staff work to try to separate out, you know, the residential and the commercial. So for those reasons too, it just, you know. I, I asked the question because I know that our audience may think that, you know, if they had a problem with that, that they should focus all their anger at the finance office. Yes. And I wanted to point out that wasn't made, <laughs> just like Wally doesn't do things in isolation. Did the council uh, have input on that? No. no. So is that, I know that when uh, Dr. Woodruff make some determinations like this. I know that he has a, um, it's not a, it's more of a management report management. item, right? Yeah, he'll send out, a, he'll so. notify us of that decision. And if we have any objections, he'll give us a certain amount of time to. Yeah. to so it's kind of a, yeah. it's it's okay unless you object to it, right. I think. Right. And I, I bet that this probably. Yeah, and I, think it was a probably great, I think it was a great idea. Again, I don't know that the people watching on the G10 realize that the finance department doesn't do this in isolation as an all powerful because it's money. They get to make the decision. Type thing. I think one important thing I'm going to mention too that he did, that we did, or was done uh, <laughs> for the commercial because that, you know, the impact there, I mean, a lot of people were just closed. You, sure. you had no revenue. And That's so right. um, we accommodated a request from several businesses that were, that have our, use our commercial garbage. Mm -hmm. Uh, service for pickup. So our minimum pickup is two times a week. So we were charging people for two pickups. So we we're picking up twice a week to a business that's closed. And so we did make, we did make a policy decision to, for temporarily reduce that to once a week. Yes. So that you 
you know, you still had service, but you didn't need the service because you had no customers. And so I thought that was a, a great accommodation, practical, business oriented move to show, you know, our support for our businesses. Oh, yeah. yeah I think that that's was, great. And this businesses were struggling. Right. And so, uh, the, the general general account, I'm sure the general fund is missing 7%, <laughs> you know, sales tax there whatever you can do to keep the business going so they'll bring back that sales tax is great. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, again, as I said, that people realize that's not a, that wasn't a decision made in uh, a cubicle in the finance department independent of any. That is correct. And I know there were a lot of uh, management type emails that went out to council during the period mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, letting them know about the delinquencies and the number of cutoffs and, and things like that. So I think everyone was sort of kept in the loop that way. Mm -hmm. So the suspensions by month, we obviously did not cut off in April, May, June, or July. However, we did continue to track those suspensions so that we could see what it looked like if we were to be in cutoff, how many people sort of were taking advantage of those orders and not paying the bill paying their bills. Um, you can see that in April, that was definitely the first month that it spiked up. And we were as high as a little over a thousand at one point in May. Then when the executive order started to, when we thought it was going to expire the end of June, you can see the decrease where people started to sort of try to catch up and make their payments. And then it, it, it got extended. So July, went back up again. And then August, we ended up in August with 507 on the shutoff list, which typically are, we average about 285 a month, which we have 19,000, about 19,000 customers. So that's not too bad, but definitely we were a lot higher than normal in August. Sabrina, do you know what the division is between residential and commercial on those numbers? I do not. Know. Okay. Um, yeah, we, when we do the list, we sort of, it's all lumped together. As far as beyond the suspensions into the actual collection numbers, I know there's been some curiosity about what our uncollectible amounts will look like if some of this debt that's accumulated, we might not be able to collect. And right now we just, we don't know for sure because typically accounts don't go into collection until they're more than 120 days past due. But what we do know is that in August, after we run shutoff, we typically give customers 10 days to reconnect once their water's cut off. If they do not reconnect within 10 days of being shut off, we go ahead and terminate their account. The reason that we do that is because surprisingly, a lot of people uh, don't notify us that they've left the property. So we don't want them to just keep accumulating those base charges when and racking up higher, you know, collection accounts when they, they don't live there. So in typically we have about 25 of those a month once we get through with shut off. And in August we had 47. So that tells us that uh, 47 people sometime between April and August either left or they don't have the funds to, to reconnect their water. We do expect it to be a little bit better this month in September because we're back to cutting off on a regular cycle, but we'll know more information in the coming months about how much of that debt we're actually getting left with if, if people are leaving. And then for the payment plans, as part of the order, we had to allow the customers a six month payment plan. And we talked about how in August we tried to make contact with all of the customers. Of course, leading up to that, we were still, we still continued to do our delinquency phone calls. We changed the messaging a bit, but we still wanted to let customers know that the bills weren't getting waived, they would still owe them. And we continued to send our emails and print the notices on the bills. So in August, when we started the, the cutoff, uh, we have now 153 customers that came in in August and they are on a payment plan now. They've taken advantage of that. And that payment plan does require that they keep their current bills paid in addition to their payment plan amount. And if for some reason they fail to pay their current bill or their payment plan amount, then they can still go into the regular disconnect. Um, 
Karina, I'm glad you mentioned the, the getting emails or other messages. Uh, I'm on the automatic payment. So I, I know I got mine when I get my the email message. I didn't get one this past month. I had to go and fish up a, an older bill to, to, to get onto the system to look up what my current bill was because I never got one. Okay, you didn't get the message telling you the bill was ready or that Correct. it- Correct. Okay, I'll check on that. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of odd and I didn't know if that might've happened to anybody else. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about it, but sometimes I know emails and things like that. Electrons go astray. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. So I'll check on that and make sure that we don't have something going on there. And then uh, finally, we did have a utility bill assistance program that we've been able to offer customers that's uh, funded by HUD, but it's administered here by the Community Engagement Division at the city. And they have actually assisted with over $40,000 in past utility bills at this point. The customers have been able to apply online for that. They do have to meet uh, some criteria. They have to show that they've been affected by COVID. Either they've lost their jobs or they've had their hours reduced or things of that nature. When it first started, they were able to get, I think it was $100 per month for up to three months. And their, the due dates again had to be during that time of the governor's orders. And just recently, they had um, extended that and said they could have they could receive up to six months uh, since COVID has now lasted longer, I think, than anticipated. So even with that six months right now, we're at about <coughs> over 40,000. And we had 270 people apply and we've helped 109, 129 of those people with their water bills. Can you comment on how the health of the enterprise fund is in the reserves? In the what? In the oh. reserves for the enterprise fund. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just started helping more with financial statements, so I should, <coughs> I, and I've been working on the water statement, so I should know. I don't know the exact number of fund balance, but it is uh, very healthy. Yeah. No, well, that's good enough. Yes. <laughs> and we, we, had no trouble meeting any of our bond covenants that say we have to meet, you know, there's a ratio that we have to meet your, um, I think it's one, 1 1.2 or something is what we look at as our target. So our revenues have to cover essentially 120% of our operational costs. And that's about, we've been very conservative in that. And the state so, requires a reserve of a certain amount. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we, and we have no problem. more than sufficient for mm -hmm. balance. Yes. That's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were actually, it's helping with our capital improvement plan because instead of borrowing for some of our projects, our model actually looks at drawing down some of that fund balance to pay for projects. That's all you have. Anybody have any other updates for the committee? We don't have the planning or anything along those lines. So you've got on there also for the next meetings. Right now, currently, it's going to be October 8th. Yes. Okay. In which case, Jill will be sitting up here. The, the woman who only needs one name. <laughs> So with that and seeing the time this evening, nobody has anything else. I would motion, excuse me, under a motion for adjournment. Anybody? Motion. There is a motion. Second. Second. Um, anybody against adjourning? Didn't think right. so. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Oh, this thing is heavy. Yeah. <laughs>